During Napoleon's reign, he was frequently under attack by the Bourbons. And the Bourbons had challenged Napoleon's right to even rule. And one of the bones of contention between Napoleon and the Bourbons was the fact that the Bourbons would appeal to their ancient past. The emblems that they would use on all of their tapestries and on their crests was the fleur-de-lis. It was a symbol of antiquity. And not to be outdone, Napoleon decided that he was going to find his own. And he lighted on the discovery of the recent tomb of Childeric I, just a century or so before. And Childeric was the son of Merovich. Merovich is this character in Frankish lore that is equal parts real human and equal parts myth. Merovich had been a great warrior. He had established the Merovingian dynasty, out of which also flowed the Frankish dynasty. And one of the things that was discovered in Childeric's tomb were a number of golden bees. Actually, they were cicadas. And these golden bees had a long history in mythology. They were used amongst the Egyptians to symbolize immortality or resurrection. Bees were believed to have come about as a result of the tears of one of the gods. And honey was believed to be the food of the gods, the nectar of the gods. And for whatever reason, the Merovingian dynasty had adopted the cicada or the bee as one of its emblems. And Napoleon found in this something that was more ancient than the fleur-de-lis, and yet which also harkened back to the French past. And so one of the things that's often overlooked when we see pictures or art of depicting Napoleon are the number of bees that are on his robes or on the walls. These bees for Napoleon were so important because they symbolized the reality of French might. It's hard to believe that bees and honey will be the thing that brings us into the Middle Ages, but in fact, it's not the honey or the bees themselves that Napoleon cared about, but it was the Frankish and the Merovingian world. And with the fall of the Western Roman half of the empire, we find ourselves in the dawn of the Middle Ages. And so in this lecture, we're going to begin a four-part series where we look at the major players on the European scene that battle and vie for the authority and for the power of what was formerly Rome. We're going to look at kingdoms like Spain, which were ruled first by the Visigoths and then later by the Islamic world. We're going to look at Anglo-Saxony and its Germanic heritage and as it began to fashion its own self-identity. And we're going to look at the Scandinavians and the Norsemen, the Vikings. But in this lecture, we're going to look at the Merovingian and the Frankish Empire. Because the Merovingian and the Frankish dynasty is perhaps the most important factor in shaping the new medieval world of the West. The Merovingians go back to a Frankish past that is first documented, we find, in the second century. There are all kinds of groups that live just north of the Roman boundary, the Roman limits. And, of course, the Romans would refer to almost all of these people just generically as the barbarians. But one of the subsets of the barbarians were the Frankish tribes. And there were a number of different Frankish groups. But shortly after the 3rd century, we see the rise of a group called the Salian Franks. And they were predominantly in the Rhine Delta. And these Salian Franks end up becoming the first group, the first barbaric tribe, to come down into the Roman territories and establish themselves as somewhat partners, not fully, but somewhat partners with the Roman establishment. We see some, of course, maintain their own identity, and they refuse to adopt any Roman practices. Others in the Salian Frankish groups, however, were more than willing to partner and to commingle themselves with the Roman ethos. And so these Frankish groups, the Salian Franks for one, and a number of others that we can't go into, and a number of other northern barbaric tribes end up forming the backbone of what we would today call the Germanic culture of northern Europe. And it needs to be stressed at this point that the Franks are not simply proto-Frenchmen. The Franks themselves are actually the forefathers of all kinds of later European cultures. They are, in fact, essentially Germanic, we would say. They have an impact on future French culture, which is, of course, why Napoleon and other Frenchmen would look back to Merovich and others as part of their past. But the Franks would equally shape Germanic culture, Dutch culture, and a number of others. And this is because the areas above the old Roman boundary lines share a common past. They share a Germanic past. 
And so when we come to the Franks, what we find is not some distinct culture necessarily, but rather a common Germanic culture that is expressed and cultivated within the Frankish world. And out of that world, as the Roman Empire falls, we find the rise of a group that calls themselves the Merovingians. Now, the Merovingians over the centuries have been known as the long-haired kings. And this is due to the fact that all of the images and all of the descriptions we have of the Merovingian kings shows them with at least hair down to their shoulders, if not sometimes even longer. And this is due to the fact that the Merovingian kings, being pagan, believed that their hair, the length of it, was somehow the key to their success and to their military might on the battlefield. And no, this doesn't seem to have arisen by some engagement with Sansom or biblical stories of long hair. This seems to have come about as a result of some sort of pagan belief in the length of their hair as serving as some kind of talisman that gives them strength. They didn't leave their hair long for the sake of ritual purity. They left their hair long because they believed it gave them some strength that others did not have. Now, the other factor of the Merovingians is that they were pagan. They had resisted the Aryan expansion in the early centuries, 4th century in particular, when there was a spread of the Aryan faith amongst certain Germanic tribes of the north, in particular groups like the Visigoths. And the main missionary to spread the Aryan faith around other barbaric tribes is Bishop Ulfilus. Ulfilus had been baptized by Eusebius of Caesarea, who was himself an Aryan, at least a modified Aryan in some ways. And Ulfilus had taken the Aryan faith to the north. He had taken it to the Germanic tribes. And it was Ulfilus who had concocted the Gothic alphabet and had translated the Bible into Old Gothic, which then led to a further expansion and spread of the Aryan faith. The Merovingians and the Franks, however, were pagan. They were not Aryans. And so Merovich, even though he was difficult to understand historically, given all the legends that surrounds him, and his son Childeric were rank-and-file pagans. They were polygamists. They espoused all kinds of ritualistic worship of various gods. Now, these gods, later by Gregory of Tours, would be wrapped up in Roman gods, and he takes Germanic gods and gives them the names Mercury and Jupiter and these kinds of things. But they seem to have worshipped their own kind of gods. And these gods and these deities had all kinds of strange ritualistic practices, certain amounts of sacrifice. In some cases, certain artifacts and talismans were used by these pagans as symbols of power and strength, just like the Scandinavians or the Vikings. The Franks and the Merovingians often would base their village or their tribe around a sacred oak or a sacred tree. And so the Merovingians and the Franks have very little to do with the expansion of the Christian faith, be it Aryan or be it Catholic. That is, of course, until Merovingian's grandson Clovis I comes to the throne. During his expansions, Clovis had taken as a bride Clotilda. And Clotilda was not a pagan. Clotilda was actually a Catholic Christian. She espoused and she believed in the Nicene Creed, the orthodoxy of the Trinity. And Clotilda worked as hard as possible to convert Clovis to the faith. Now, Clovis resisted this entirely. He did not want to hear anything about the Christian faith, and he resisted baptism. And Clotilda, on two occasions, is forced to baptize her sons in secret. Now, at the end of it, Clovis relents. He begins to hear the faith. He begins to hear Clotilda. And on Christmas 496, Clovis submits to baptism. Now, this is vitally important because Clovis has converted to the Christian faith, but he has not converted to the Aryan faith, which was dominant around all other northern European tribes. He converted to the Catholic faith, the faith of Clotilda, which means that he now embraced the Nicene faith. And it also meant that he had now some relationship with the established leaders of the Catholic faith, in particular, the Pope. Now, in many ways, Clovis still goes about his warrior band mentality. He still takes with him his comes, which are his warrior bands, his, his leaders of the armies with him. And comes is etymologically the origin of the word count, or as a ruler, a count. And there would be others as well. Duques would become the dukes. And the ideal for the Merovingian expansion is that these warrior bands would go and they would attack and they would conquer a region. 
And then Clovis, or any other Merovingian king for that matter, would distribute and parcel out the land now conquered to his comes, to those who had loyalty with him in battle. Now you can imagine, the more you conquer land, the more you distribute it, often gave rise to the fact that the Merovingian Empire felt that it did not have enough land despite the fact that it had conquered vast numbers of territories. 